Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope the mics are on. Thanks for having me. I lived and worked in Washington twice for a total of about a dozen years. I've never been up here before. And it's really very, very beautiful. And somebody told me that you're a lot of Catholics here. Is that true? <laughs> Can I confirm that? The only reason I say it is you're, you're already in trouble because I am the worst kind of Catholic. A Sunday communicant convert who runs the parish council of his church. This is a really small church, like 400 people. It's the hardest job I've ever had, by far. I mean, actually, when, when I worked for President Reagan, I was a, one of his deputy budget directors. I think I had budget for about I don't know, a third of the U.S. government, and being the head of the local parish council in Reading, Connecticut is far harder than anything I've ever done before. So I want to start off with a couple of general thoughts, and then maybe tell you a little about myself, and then I really want to take questions. I, I want to hear from you. I'm dying to hear from you. You're going to agree with some of the things I say, and you're going to disagree with, with uh, others, other things that I say. And I'm in the business of disputes and broadcasting, so it's okay. You can say anything you want. I'm trying to persuade the church, um, the church, like the church in Rome, the Vatican, not to be afraid of what I'm going to call abundance. Abundance. And another name for abundance is success and wealth and income, material success. We'll I'm going to get to the spiritual side in a minute. For some reason, and it isn't just, it isn't just Pope Francis, although he's, he's the worst uh, I've seen in a while on, on the economy. And I understand that. He's from Argentina. And I used to spend some time as a consultant. Actually, the last free market government in Argentina, I was a consultant. So the Pope's never really seen the system work. But for some reason, down through the years, decades, and centuries, the Catholic Church, unlike other churches, has always had this guilt complex about doing well. And so I'm here to tell you there's nothing wrong with doing well. You know, I want you to work hard, and graduate, and get good jobs, and do well. It's very important. We had. Um, in New York City, St. Patrick Cathedral is in terrible disrepair. Now, we fixed part of it. Uh, I'm not particularly active in the church. I know the Archbishop, Cardinal Dolan, and I know his predecessor, Cardinal Egan, but I, I'm, I really do most of my, my uh, churching up in Connecticut. But you need a couple hundred million dollars to fix the roof of St. Patrick's Cathedral, a couple hundred million bucks which is a lot of money. And as Pope Francis started out with his earliest pronouncements, attacking markets, capitalism, and what he called trickle-down economics, you can imagine how hard it was to raise money for St. Patrick Cathedral, because the people you're going to go to in New York City are people in the financial community who are capitalists. And they didn't like the fact that the Pope seemed to be beaten up on you know, what they do for a living and what their whole ethos is. And I had a meeting with Cardinal Dolan, who's a wonderful, wonderful man, wonderful, about this, and a couple of other guys who were involved in the fundraising. And I, and I showed him a graph, a chart. Um, the church doesn't, doesn't have a lot of charts, but I showed him a chart, which he read, that showed over the past three decades, past three decades, abject dollar-a-day poverty around the world, all right? Abject dollar-a-day poverty around the world fell by over 80%. And the reason it fell was the spread of market-based capitalism in key parts of the world, particularly communism.
communist China and socialist India, parts of Latin America, not on the east coast where the Pope lived at Argentina, but more on the west coast, sub-Sahara Africa, and even parts of Russia. These numbers come from the World Bank, which by and large is uh, a very liberal left organization, not particularly attuned to Ronald Reagan or free market capitalism or any of the stuff that, that I represent. But they did the numbers, and the numbers were subsequently confirmed. Over 80% of the dollar a day, literally, literally, hundreds of millions of people, hundreds of millions of people in the last 30 some odd years have gone from destitute poverty to the middle class. And that's my beef with the church, which I love, which has given me a new life. But that's my beef. You know, I'm not making this up. You can go online after this is over and dial up the World Bank and you'll see. It's right there. Articles being written about it. That's a remarkable achievement. Socialism didn't do it. Communism didn't do it. Feudalism didn't do it. Colonialism didn't do it. Free market capitalism did it. And achieved what we all want, which is to have better lives, materially. And I say that to you uh, as young Catholics. I say it as an older Catholic. I say it as a statement to the church. Be not afraid, in John Paul II's phrase, be not afraid of abundance. There's nothing wrong with that. Now, on the other side of the coin is a phrase from Matthew's, from the Gospel of Matthew, which is quite simply, we must help the least of our brethren. We must help the least of our brethren, AKA poor people, of whom unfortunately there are way too many in this country and around the world, way too many. And we've had, even for America, which is the greatest economy in the history of history. We've had too much poverty and neglect and sluggishness, and people are in a bad mood, and we just haven't had a good economic time in about 15 years. And you know what? I, I can stand up here and tell you why I disagree with Barack Obama, but I don't really feel like it today. I I'm, I, I mostly, you know, it, it's no secret that, you know, he, he I mean, I've had, I've had dinner at somebody's house a long time ago. Uh, we don't agree on, on the way the world works. Uh, but frankly, it was under Republican and Democratic presidents, Republican and Democratic Congresses. In the last 15, 16 years, we've had the worst economic story uh, in, uh, you know, 100 years. We've grown by just barely 2% per year. America's normal growth is 3.5% a year since World War II, and in fact, for the whole 20th century, including the Great Depression, we grew at about 3.5% a year. During the Kennedy years, we grew at close to 5%. During the Reagan and Clinton years, we grew at close to 5%. Those were the great decades. Bush Obama will not go down in history as a particularly prosperous uh, period. I'm writing a book. I'm almost done with the galleys of John F. Kennedy was one of my idols, a church-going Catholic, by the way. And uh, he was the first supply sider who lowered marginal tax rates because he wanted to get the economy moving again. And he knew if he didn't, he wouldn't be reelected. So he was a good Catholic capitalist. I worked on his younger brother, Teddy, for years, and I failed. But John was very good. That was a joke. It's OK. You can add some joke. Feel free. Listen up. It's all right. Um, so I just want to make that point. Markets work if you let them and if you design it properly. And the church as a whole uh, has, in my opinion, much, much more progress. We want to help people, right? We want to mitigate poverty. We want to help the least of our brethren. But the way to do it is through individual economic freedom and choice 
not through state run common. Vietnam and Cambodia, it failed. I don't know if you saw the interview, perhaps you don't. My friend Charlie Rose, a very good interviewer each night on TV, and Charlie interviewed Lee Kuan Yew, the longtime Prime Minister of Singapore, and he created the modern Singapore, which is a phenomenal uh, example of prosperity. And Charlie asked him, in all your years, he governed for like 50 years, who was the greatest world statesman you ever met? And Lee said right off the top, Deng Xiaoping. Deng Xiaoping because he instituted the market economy in China and turned the whole country around and went against, went against his whole Communist Party apparatus. And as you may know, in a place like that, they play for keeps. So if they don't like you, they shoot you. I mean, we just had the Cultural Revolution. Uh, Mao Zedong, they killed whatever, 40 or 50 million people. So. China has been the best illustration possible. I just want to say that uh, you probably know that about me. I'm a devoted free market capitalist. I began my television show for a dozen years that free market capitalism is the best path to prosperity. Uh, I said it because I mean it. Uh, I still do it on the radio. By the way, here in Washington, we're on WMAL from 7 to 10 p.m. I'm in 169 cities across the country. You can hear us on WMAL uh, every Saturday night. Now. Now, a few tidbits, some aphorisms, and then I want you to react, and I want to take your questions. I am fundamentally an optimist. And if there's anything you take away from this talk, I want you to take away the notion and the importance of optimism. Optimism. The Lord didn't put us here to be pessimistic. The Lord put us here to do the Lord's work, which is greatness, which is improvement, which is character, which is love and charity, and taking care of the least among us. So you have to be optimistic. If you have only one shred of faith, you should be an optimist. It's so important. You know, you, you do a TV show for many, many years, and you know, we have these numbers. But I, I get graded every night. They're called ratings. Um, the nemesis of my life is ratings. And our show, it's just so great. You know, we're an opinion show, and you know, I'm up there winging it every night and throwing guests in and whatnot. And you know, we've been rated at the top of the network. For you, the middle of the network, the bottom of the network, whatever. And we might have a bad night. We come in in the uh, afternoon, start doing the show, and I see some long faces. And I would say, forget, stop, for leave, forget about it. We're doing great. We're doing the Lord's work. We're doing the work that God wants us to do. So important. My whole life, I think, is testimony to optimism and faith. Now, as you know, I'm a Catholic convert. Uh, I was received into the church in um, 1997. Uh, so we're, what are we, eight, 18 years. Uh, St. Thomas More in New York, Upper East Side of New York. And it was a great day. And I'm a guy who has been through some ups and downs. Right. You're seeing me in a pretty good period of my life right now. I'm relaxed. I don't have to grind out a show every night. I go on the network two or three days a week and do lots of things like fly to Washington and talk to students and like you. Um, but it was not always so. And I'll just tell you a brief little story. I've been blessed. I've been to good schools. I had good jobs. I had a good career. I started at the Federal Reserve many, many years ago. I worked on Wall Street as an economist. I was pulled into the Reagan administration in his, in his sub-cabinet, 
And I was 30 years old and I was deputy budget director and I was completely unqualified. In fact, every job I've had in my career, I've been unqualified and have had to grow into it. So much for credentials. So. Um, went to government, came back to Wall Street, was rated in the top couple of economists on Wall Street. And in the early 90s, uh, came down with an affliction whereupon I was hopelessly, uh, hopelessly abusing alcohol and drugs. Hopeless. Hopeless to me, hopeless to the people around me, hopeless to my wife, who was a saint and is still with me, and defeated. I mean, defeated, like on my knees, defeated. And I had no faith, I had no religion, I had nothing. I knew the Lord's Prayer from chapel at prep school. That's all I knew. So, looking back, that was close 20 years ago, I, coming up this late spring, early summer, I'll be 20 years sober and clean. Looking back, that defeat and that failure, which ruined my life and my career, and for a while my marriage. That defeat was probably the best thing that could ever happen to me. Because I had to change everything. And I had to open my ears and listen to what people were telling me. And I was sent away to a long-term care program in northern Minnesota where they locked me up for six months. The best thing that ever happened. My wife gave me a one-way plane ticket. I'll never forget this to Twin Cities Airport. She gave me 20 bucks for the cab fare. I didn't have a dime. And she said, you need to do this or not. If you don't do it, I'm out of here. And I did. And I learned a lot. I'm not here to talk to you about alcohol treatment and drug treatment. I'm, I'm just here to tell you that in life, sometimes failure can be a great learning experience. And I went through this. I went through this. And several years later, after I got sober, I did come into the church. I loved the church. I, I loved Mass. The first time I went to Mass, which was before I converted, I absolutely fell in love with it. Everything, the order, the traditions, the candles, the incense, the water, everything. I said, God, this is great. And why didn't I learn this? This is great. Rules. I needed rules. And there was the church. Now, some people tell me, those of you who went to high school and parochial school and had, had enough rules. I, I can't get enough rules. My life was so bad, I needed rules. But my point is a simple point, and it goes a little bit to the season in which we find ourselves, which is my favorite time of the year. Um, many of us, most of us, are sinners who will fail but that doesn't mean we won't succeed later. It doesn't mean that we won't learn the value of work and energy and faith and optimism. It can be done. It can be done. A day at a time. I'm here today. Today's a great day. You can have it the same way. We work the way God wants us to work. We live the way God wants us to live. We behave the way God wants us to behave. We serve others the way God wants us to serve others. We go to work in whatever it is you want to do, whether it's financial, architecture, biotech, physics, teaching. Whatever it is we want to do, we learn to do it in God's name as service, as service to other people. There's nothing wrong with doing it for yourself, but it's better when you think of serving and helping other people. I believe that. Learned it the hard way, but it's okay. It's a good thing. You might think about that when you go back to your dorms and your classrooms or go home or whatever. Think about that. The whole essence of capitalism it's about helping other people, serving other people. The great Scottish moralist philosopher clergyman Adam Smith, who started and invented free market capitalism in the Scottish environment in the mid-late 18th century, always taught 
that free markets function best when they have a moral, ethical basis for honesty, rules, laws. That's when the, the system works worse when you forget about your ethics and your morals and your laws. And I always say to people, friends of mine and others, I sponsor kids, um, when you go to work or you go to class, don't check your morals and ethics at the door. When you hang up your coat, don't leave your ethics behind. Take it with you into whatever it is you're going. Don't forget that. And you do it for yourself, but you do it for other people, too. I get very cross at crooks in my former business on Wall Street. Very cross. And some of the, when I was broadcasting every night and it was very hard on some of them, I would get calls from old friends of mine, why are you beating up on us? I said, because I'm sick and tired of bad behavior. I don't like it. It hurts the system. Nobody gets rich for long with bad behavior. So it reminds me of the Easter season in this important respect. And I talked about this on the radio Saturday in a stream of conscience. But the crucifixion of Jesus Christ is one of the hardest, worst, most violent stories in history. I don't know if you saw the TV version of O'Reilly's book, Killing Jesus. It's played last Sunday, and I believe it's playing this Sunday. Go see it, or try to see it. Now, I'm, I'm not shilling for Bill. I, I read it. I don't think it was his best book, but I read it. I couldn't quite make the whole movie. I could, it was too violent at the end. It was too violent. I, I know, I know that is what happened, factually, historically. I know that. It just didn't mean I had to sit through and watch it. But. Here's my real point. For all of us, we go through some form of being put on the cross. The great theologian, Father Richard Newhouse, who was a Lutheran minister who converted to Catholicism, he founded First Things magazine, wrote numerous books, a brilliant man. I knew him quite well before he passed away, wrote a wonderful book called Death on a Friday Afternoon. And in that book, he basically chronicles the last days of Christ and the last words of Christ. But he says, particularly in America, which is such a great, prosperous, abundant nation, he said, when it comes to Good Friday and Easter, we all love to go to Sunday, which is the resurrection, which is a wonderful story. And we love to miss Friday afternoon, which was the crucifixion and a brutal story, where Christ died brutally to save us from our sins, literally, to save us. And so Father Newhouse reminds how important Friday is in order to get to Sunday. I'm reminding you, or I'm telling you, as a friend, I come as a friend. In my own personal life, I had to go through Friday before I could get to Sunday. And I did. That was a miracle. That was my miracle. And it was the greatest thing that ever happened to me. And when I look back on it, as I said before, um, the Friday part was the turning point when you fall off your horse. And we all do, and we all will, and we shouldn't be embarrassed. And it's always good, any good shrink will tell you it's good to talk about it. You can go to any whatever 12-step meetings, that's what they tell you. Go to good church meetings, go to Bible teachings, whatever. Talk about it, talk about it openly. And that's what I went through. And I'm blessed, I'm blessed. So I always fall back on these thoughts with a group like this. I'm not here to give you a lecture about the Federal Reserve Board or tax policy or economic freedom or why the church is wrong about capitalism. I mean, I'm mentioning it, but I don't want to go into it too heavily. I just want to share with you 
one Indian's experience insofar as falling off the horse, going on the cross, having to recover from that, changing my life, and ultimately to rebuild it through faith and optimism. Faith and optimism. And one last point, hard work, hard work. I can't begin to tell you. I want to look at each of you in the eye. There is nothing greater in your life, no matter what endeavor you go through, if you want to help other people and yourself, hard work. Like hard work, much harder work, even harder work than that than you've ever dreamed possible. I've given a number of commencement speeches on this very topic alone. Hard work. It is God's work. It's what he wants us to do. And when we do it, it will pay off. It will pay off a lot. And when you do it, you'll turn failure into success. And you'll help others. And you'll feel good when you wake up in the morning. These are the values that really count that really, really count. So today, I'll end on this point. I, I never saw it coming. <laughs> I get out of treatment center back in 1995, and I start a new life, and I had no idea how it was gonna turn out, none. I lived in a sober men's house in Southern California for a while and then eventually took a job out there with a dear friend and worked things through on a day-by-day -day basis. And as time passed, didn't even realize it that I was changing my career and my profession. I was an economist in the government at the Fed and Wall Street and all this, a forecaster, a commentator on financial matters. But I started doing a lot of television at the request of others and one day, I'm sitting in my office in New York City by this time, and I get a call from the then president of NB NBC News, a wonderful guy named Neil Shapiro, who now runs public broadcasting, terrific guy. And um, he says to me, it's a Thursday afternoon, if I'm not mistaken, I'm going to end on this. He says, your friend Geraldo, Geraldo Rivera, who's a very good friend of mine, um, who had a TV show on CNBC, primetime, best show, it was the highest rated show on the network. And he's paid a lot of money, I think. He was getting outrageous amounts of money, which I've never let him forget down through the years. So the United States invades Afghanistan post 9-11. This was in the autumn of, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, 2001. And Geraldo ups and leaves, he just leaves. He wants to cover the war in Afghanistan. He had been a war correspondent. He resigns from CNBC, re resigns from NBC, he has no backing, he just goes to cover the war. And NBC, which owned the prime time of CNBC in those days, had a big hole from 9 to 10 p.m., which in that business is the highest rated and uh, most financially remunerative hour of the day. Okay, you can't make money from 9 to 10, cash it in, you're through. So anyway, Neil Shapiro calls me, I'm sitting there and says, you, Larry Kudlow, I've met him, and your buddy Jim Kramer, Jimmy and I used to square off uh, together all the time. You are going to take Geraldo's spot and run his show. And I said, that's great. You know, in a couple months, that gets it. No, no. He said, you're going to start Monday. This was Thursday. Uh, neither of us had ever read a teleprompter. We knew nothing about running a show. I've never talked with an earpiece in my head and never heard a producer yelling at me before mid-sentence. And we did it. And we were, God, awful the first few weeks and months. But it worked out fine. And what I'm telling you is that that morphed my, me into a second career as a broadcaster, full time, and a journalist, full time. And maybe that's the way the Lord had designed it all along, but I never knew until it happened. And I did it, and it worked, and there were ups and downs, but I never worked harder. And I believe I subsisted on faith and hope and optimism. And that's what I'm trying to impart to you. You and me, we can't predict the future. Only the man upstairs. 
but we can operate each day, you know, and helping others and having faith and being optimistic that this story, this story, which is the greatest story ever told, will unfold if we let it. When the student is ready, the teacher appears. I want you to keep an open mind, everything I've said. It's really what I'm telling you is not about the economy. It's not about politics. About the light. It's about a life of faith and how that life can succeed. And it's from getting from Friday afternoon to Sunday. It worked for me. I hope it works for you. God bless. Thank you for having me. You're very kind. Um, I want to hear from you. I don't have tons of time because I've got to catch a plane. I apologize in advance, but feel free to come up and storm the ramparts here. Yeah. What do you say to somebody who plays free and abundance? Louder. What do you say to somebody who conflates greed and abundance? Who conflates greed and abundance? Well, they need a good course in moral philosophy, be my guess, or religion or haul them off to church or temple or something. Um, you know, greed and prosperity, look, I, people say greed is part of capitalism, and, I, and it is, it is. It's just a matter of priorities and a matter of definitions and words. You know, Adam Smith defined it as acting in your own self-interest, and Adam Smith the, again, I go back to him because he was a churchman and he taught in the moral philosophy department of the uh, University of uh, Edinburgh. There was no economics in those days. It was done in moral philosophy. And he said that what made capitalism such a great system was that you were engaging in transactions between consenting adults that were mutually beneficial. So if you and I make a deal, I presume we're making it because you're getting something and I'm getting some. And the sum of the parts is greater than the whole. So that's what I have. If you want to call that greed, I would say greed is part of it. Greed is part of it. But that's the way the system works. Breaking the law is not part of it. That's where I draw the line. You're not going to let me get away with all that. Come on. I know there's some questions out there. Yes. Would you, care to comment, would you care to comment on David Stockman's work, The Great Deformation? Uh, he seems to draw sharper lines between sort of ongoing, everyday transactions and the kinds of relationships between government and, and, um, and business that resulted in the crisis we have been getting through recently. So w would you like to address that? Not particularly. <laughs> would you do it for me? Please? Look, David, David was my boss uh, for, I don't know, three and a half years at the you know, Office of Management Budget. And um, uh, we were at one time very, very close friends. We're still friendly. Um, I've been trying to haul him off to church for years, unsuccessfully. and. Um, all I'll say is he, he looks at the world through very pessimistic lens. I don't. I don't. Now, there could be systemic changes. I don't want to go into details about government and business. And I don't like crony capitalism. I don't like corporate welfare. But, you know, on the whole, this country has done pretty darn well for the last couple hundred, 300 years. You know, it's the greatest experiment in democracy ever. And it's the greatest experiment in free market capitalism ever. Now, we've had our ups and downs. You know, we've been on the cross. We've gone from Friday to Sunday. I, you know, I, listen, I, I was a, what was I, 29, 30 year old kid and get this appointment to OMB, uh, sub cabinet level. I, had, I was way, in way over my head. So trust me, I'm not just being modest. There's stuff that. But I had a reputation. They were looking for somebody on Wall Street who had some credibility with numbers, so I went in. Maybe I was the only guy in the building that could count. Okay, that's why I was there. And that was a time of extreme pessimism and negative psychology 
in America, 1980. And you know what? I, don't, I can blame part of it on Jimmy Carter, but believe me, it accumulated over many years. In some sense, I've written about this, and this will be in the book on JFK. The Republicans in the 1970s were worse than the Democrats. Nixon, Nixon, all right, and his daughters and sons-in-law are dear friends of mine, okay? And I spent some time with him in the 1980s, but he was the worst economic president since Herbert Hoover, another Republican. So, you know, we've made mistakes, but we've come back from it. And the great thing about democracy, and this is my sort of bottom, bottom, bottom line, is in a democracy, the, when the people of the country collectively decide that things are going in the wrong direction, they can do something about it peacefully at the ballot box. It's a great system. It's a great system. And that's what happens. And changes occur. You know, we're about to have another big election coming up. Uh, President, whatever you think of Obama, he can't run for a third term. And we're, you know, we're going to sort of do this all over again. And that was the thing when I worked for Reagan. It was extreme negative psychology. And in two or three years, in two or three years, the whole story had turned around. And I'm going to give Reagan some credit for that. I'm going to give the country a lot of credit for that. I'm going to give the businesses in the country a lot of credit for that. Well, Reagan basically, he'd be the first guy to tell you if he were here, he just put a little more freedom into the equation and then let people run with the ball. And they did good. You know, it's funny, um, it's one of my disagreements, President Obama likes to say for decades we had the wrong top-down, trickle-down economic model which included President Clinton and uh, President Reagan. I always tell Bill Clinton that he was Reagan's third term. Uh, he, depending on his mood, he either doesn't like that or will accept that, but he was. He was Reagan's third term. And in that period from roughly 1980 uh, to 2006 or 2007, the United States created nearly 50 million new jobs. 50 million new jobs. The delta, the change, in our gross domestic product, not the level, the change over that 20-something year period uh, was larger than uh, the entire economy of Europe. Like we created another Europe. That's how things can improve. So I don't want you to, don't be pessimistic now. You know, I said to people, stock market, buy the dip. That's the way I so buy the dip. Want some investment advice? It's free, so you can take it for what it's worth. Market goes down 1%, 5%, 10%, buy the dip. You know why? Better times are coming. You know why I say that? They always do. And you know why I say that? Not only is historical fact on my side, but remember, you're talking to an optimist who has faith. Depending on your point of view, that's either the best possible profile or the worst, but that's who I am. And I'm still long in the market. I'm in my 60s, and my wife and I, we still, we still own a lot of stocks. Other questions? A little more? One more? Last one? Sure. Go right ahead. Mr. Kudlow, could you uh, comment further on the economic miracle in China and Singapore, and also what's happening in Russia, the old Soviet Union, economically? Well, you know, look, ch in some sense, China is a lot easier because the story has greater clarity. It ain't perfect. I mean, 40% of the Chinese economy is still state-run, basically. Uh, but that's from 100% you know, state-run. And you can tell the difference. Um, my favorite is Vietnam. What's happened in Vietnam is remarkable. And um, unfortunately, Vietnam is not a democracy, but it, the economy has been loosened up substantially. Um, so Russia is, oh God, we don't have enough time to talk about Russia. I was there, actually there at the inception. A bunch of us went over at the request of the Yeltsin administration. Gennady Berbulov was the um, chief of staff, the prime minister in effect, and everything, uh, sitting in, in uh, Stalin's old office. We have meetings in Joe Stalin's old office. Think about that. And, you know, they really started out with a great market economy, then they stuttered, then they went back to it. Now, unfortunately, under Putin, it's become a very authoritarian. 
not just the politics, which are probably worse, but the economy has become authoritarian. So the, the experiment is not an utter failure, it just hadn't worked as well as it could have. But I'm optimistic about that, too. I mean, Russia's going through a very difficult recession right now for a whole lot of reasons. And they're going to throw Putin out, and they're going to put reformers back in, and it'll move ahead. Look, the uh, other parts of Eastern Europe have done great. Great. Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary. I knew a lot of these people. We were consoling. Anyway, so it makes me very optimistic. The one that I want to go back and refix is Latin America. But we had that one. Now it's going in the wrong direction. And then, I don't know, Southern Europe. I, I don't know. So you, Spain, Italy, what's the Greece? Oh, Greece is a country that peaked in 450 BC. I mean, I don't know what to do with it. Uh, I don't know what to do with it. You know, um, it's all gone socialist on me. But then again, um, it was actually Pope Benedict who said this a lot. More people in Europe should go to church. <laughs> would that help the economy? Yeah, that it would. I don't ask me how, but it would. Um, more people everywhere should go to church. Fill up the church pews. Um, I, young men and women, go to church. Just sit there and take it in. It's a couple thousand years old. And over the course of a mass, over the course of a mass, you know, it's, whether it's the gospel reading or the sacrament of the Eucharist, you will pick something up that will stay with you. And just that little bit of faith can really grow from a mustard seed into a mountain. And that's why I want you to go to church every now and then. Be not afraid. I have to go. Thank you.